Thank you for joining Wars of the Roses. As we continue with part three, The Philosophy of Fire from The Philosophy of Fire by R. Swinburne Clymer. Misconceptions. A destructive misconception so often met with in those who are apparently following the path to a higher evolution, leading them to believe, often to teach, that in order to follow the illuminating life, one must ignore the body and its physical powers, the family and its necessities, the sex and its demands, is totally devoid of any foundation, in fact. The secret schools teach that man must render unto Caesar that which belongs to Caesar, neglecting none of the four divisions of his being, giving equal attention to each department of his nature, at the same time inculcating the positive doctrine that the man allowing anything to interfere with his search for the ultimate of conscious individuality, the Holy Grail, is a weakling and a disgrace to his creator. The Philosophy of Fire the philosophy of fire underlies all true initiation as well as the secret doctrine and the ancient mysteries. It is likewise the foundation upon which rest all mystic and occult fraternities. Of all the secret orders of the present day, probably more is known of the grand fraternity of the Rose Cross than of any other of the secret schools. The grand fraternity is composed of the Triple Order, the Rose Cross Order, the Temple of the Rosy Cross, and the Hierarchy of Ulysses. This is not because the fraternity itself has given extensively of its teachings to the profane world, but rather through the voluminous writings of such of its members as Hargrave Jennings, Pascal Beverly Randolph, Lord Belwell Lytton, Honoré de Balzac, Freeman B. Dowd, and others. In a manifesto published during the year 1871 by the then Supreme Master of the Triple Order, P.B. Randolph, M.D., it is freely admitted the foundation of the teachings of the fraternity is the philosophy of fire. It is urged against us that we believe in and practice magic. We admit the fact, we certainly do, the pure, white, bright, effulgent, radiantly glorious magic of the human will, the occult arcanum of the secret schools, through and by which alone human passions are made to correct themselves and by which alone otherwise defenseless woman is fully armed against the coarse brutality of thousands of misnamed men and husbands. And this is a purely Christic power too, an integrant of the early Christic faith, dead here and buried nearly everywhere else beneath mountains of gabble dust and deserts of error. It is further charged that we have certain quite extraordinary esoteric or secret doctrines. We admit the fact and the animus is apparent from that other fact, namely that these secret doctrines are only divulged to the pure, virtuous and worthy. Our assailants failed in all their schemes to penetrate these mysteries and the inference is plain, nor can even the disaffected fail to see the reason why. Now, however, we herewith present some of these secret doctrines. We teach that deity dwells within the cryptic portals of the luminous worlds and that the lamp that lights it is supreme love. We assert that no power ever comes to man through the intellect, that goodness alone is power, and that that pertains to the heart only. Hence, that power comes to the soul only through love. Not lust, mind you, but love. The underlying final fire life, subtending the bases of being, the formative flowing floor of the world, the true sensing of which is the beginning of the road to personal power. Love lieth at the foundation, and is the synonym of life and strength and clingingness. Holding as we do that deity dwells within the shadow behind the everlasting flame, the amazing glories of which minds have confounded with the very God, we declare all things, especially the human soul, to be a form of fire. That man is not the only intelligence in nature, but that there are, and the aerial spaces abound with, multiform intelligences having their conscious origin in eth, as man has his in matter and that there are grades of these towering away in infinite series of hierarchies, human and ultra-human, to an unimaginable eternal. Fundamental teachings of the Aeth priesthood. We inculcate the doctrine that the soul is a polar world of white fire within the human body, that its negative pole resides within the brain as a general dwelling, that in dreamless sleep it goes to the solar plexus, abdominal brain, to impart stores of life fire to the body, in dream it visits, by sight and rapport, other scenery, and that all dreams have a determinate meaning and purpose, even though they may merely indicate indigestion or the eating of improper food, which will produce disease in the system. 
We maintain that the other pole of the soul is situated within the genital system, pelvic brain. That the superior pole of the soul is in direct magnetic and ethereal contact with the soul of being. The foundation fire of the universe with all that vast domain underlying increase, growth, emotion, beauty, power, heat, energy, the soul and base of being, the subtending live or fire floor of existence. Hence through love man seizes directly on all that is and can come into actual contact and rapport with every being that feels and loves and dwells within the confines of God's habitable universe. Declaring that true manhood is more or less on rapport with one or more of the upper hierarchies of intelligent potentialities, earthborn and not earthborn, we believe and teach, there are means whereby a person may become associated with and receive instruction from them. More than that, we believe in talismans, that it is possible to construct and wear them and that they emit a peculiar light discernible across the gulfs of space by these intelligent powers, just as we discern a diamond across a playhouse that such signal to the beholders and that they will and do cross the chasmal steeps to save, succor and assist the wearer, just as a good brother here flies to the relief of him who shall give the grand hailing signs of distress. God, the soul of the universe is positive heat, celestial fire, the aura of deity, God odd is love, the prime element of all power, the external fire, sphere, the informing and formative pulse of matter, the induction is crystalline, for it follows that whoso hath most love, whether its expression be coarse or fine, cultured or rude, hath therefore most of God in him or her, the element of time being competent to the perfection of all refining influences over the ocean, if not upon the hither side. Another Rosicrucian wrote, Justice is so late of arrival to all original thinkers, the terms of prejudice and of astonishment, not in the good sense, are so long in falling off from profound researches that even now the Rosicrucians, in other words, the Paracelsians or Magnetists, are totally ignored as the archchemists, the experimenters in fire, to whose deep thoughts and unrelaxing labors modern science is indebted for most of its truths. As astrology, not the jugglers of the stars, but the true explorers seeking the method of being and of working of the glittering habitants of space, was the mother of astronomy, so is the law of the Hermetic Brethren, the groundwork of all present philosophy. On its applied side, Rosicrucianism is the science which is so familiar and so valuable. But as the Hermetic Rosicrucian beliefs are a great religion, they of course have their popular adaptations, and in consequence there is a mythology to them. There must always be a machinery, symbolism, to every faith through which it may be known and the mistake of people is in accepting the childish machinery and colored mythology of a religion for the religion itself. Mystical, fantastical and transcendental, nay impossible as the studies and objects of the Rosicrucians seem to be in these modern ultra-practical days. It is forgotten that the truths of contemporaneous science are all based on the dreams of the old thinkers. Out of natural philosophy, the occult brethren sought the spirit of natural philosophy and to this inner heaven so unlike ordinary life through purification of the self through invocations. Invocation development belongs peculiarly to the Magi system of soul growth. Through humbling and prayers, through penances to change the desires of the body for worldly things, through fumigations and incensing to raise up another world about them and to place themselves on rapport with the inhabitants of it, through the purifying of the senses and thereby to the opening of the finer senses, to the shutting out of one state in order to make possible the passing into another state, to all this the Rosicrucians sought to reach. The Hermetic doctrine is merely a part of the universal Rosicrucian system, a branch of the Grand Fraternity. Their teachings concerning fire are identical with the Rosicrucian doctrines. Fire is at once the great purifier and separator of elements. It is hell for the evil, but on the pure spirit it works no injury. For pure soul is also the soul of the fire. The whole world must be purified by this fire, the intensity of true love for the new dispensation. When we recall the fact that fire is also the basis of life, we will understand what love really is and may do for us and the whole human family. Like all other things he touches, the undeveloped man has constantly acted to draw down to his plane of being everything belonging to the higher conception of sex, which is itself a form of fire. He forgets it is the direct emanation of the divine creative thought. 
all the highest, purest, and sweetest thoughts lead up to the manifestation of the sex condition and sex forces as the Alpha and the Omega, at once the beginning and the end of both desire and fulfillment. It holds within itself the whole divine statement of being, and God said, let there be, and there was. Life and death are in it, the outpouring and the indrawing. All the great lessons of living and acting are held in the three-lettered word of unperfected activity. The law of love, God expression in man, holds its basis of manifestation on the health activity of the sex function, the basis wherein dwells the physical fire. The beginning and the end of life, if we so will it, is held here. The moment of conclusion is the beginning of a new life. It is also the moment of death, the dead point at which the whole organism enters into the realms of dissolution, as it is ever striving to do. But the great sex force and body of life carries always forward and beyond, so there shall be no dwelling within the house of death. It is in this house of the fire of life wherein is manifested the completion of the divine plan. It is here the was becomes the is, and this is is passes into the shall be. It is through this differentiation that the great trinity manifests itself unto itself. Verily the kingdom of heaven, the power of God, lies within us for the transmission of life. His knowledge of its origin is the point at which his supremacy assumes for itself unquestioned authority, the omnipotence of the one only unity. Love, sex, and fire are one. The three in one see divine alchemy. In Sweden on the 1st of May, the opening or germination of the year, the peasantry, as they do all over the north at certain times, light fires. A candle is lighted by all devout Catholics on Christmas Eve and is kept burning in memory and as a reminder of the mysterious incarnation until the dawning of the real day of the blessed nativity. The Yule log, whose bright blazing is of so much moment that with the last brand of it most carefully and superstitiously laid aside for the purpose, the next year's Christmas fire is to be lighted follows the same rule. The Christmas tree, the origin of which is lost in the mists of tradition and which Teutonic emblem, time out of mind employed in Germany, was transposed into England, though without the slightest suspicion of its pagan meaning, is the mystic northern sacrifice and the attestation in its multitudinous blazing candles to the genius or the god of the fire. The toys representing all the things of man and of the earth, which are suspended among the boughs in its mystic light, are the sacrifices of all good things of the world and all the products of the creative fiat, as in surrender and acknowledgement, back to the unknown living spirit or immortal producer who hath chosen fire as his symbol and his shadow. If the reader will refer to the crest of his royal highness, Prince Albert, he will find the mystic, magic horns distinctly set up, the reproduction of the ever-recurring symbol which is recognizable as horns, wings, or otherwise in the headpieces of his ancestors of the North. The rough rustic soldiers who in their barbarian incursions overturned, in the Roman beliefs, and buried in the ruins of the empire, a faith identical in its secrets with their own, all ignorant of the fact that the symbols of both spoke but the same tale, the original solar fire faith. The laurel wreath around the head of heroes and emporers accorded only to the great conquerors, the imperator or the poet, majestic triplicate, not only mark out the line and denote the place of the organs of the highest intellectual and godlike faculties in the brows of the human being, but prove the knowledge of the ancients of phrenology and represent the original starry radius, that which symbolically invests the head of all the gods. It speaks the spirit flame radius, magnetic and supernatural, intensifying to its real magico-generative power in a circle of intolerable light about the head, in which mystic light, all magic and sorcery, as well as all sainthood, was supposed by the Rosicrucians to be possible in accordance with the laws of the supernatural fire world. Crowns, garlands, wreaths, all the insignia of dignity that encircle the head, and all passing, be it remarked, over the Sisyko-phrenological places of the faculties of causality, comparison, wonder and imagination, and in tracing them along, disclosing and glorifying all the bodily points of the means of the greatness of man, mitres and priestly head coverings, the tonsure of the sacerdotes, freeing the sacred circle of the intellect within which may the terrifically grand very apprehension of God himself be realized from the barbarian and the degraded 
Nay, brute-like growth of hair, the very investiture and most closely branding confession, and the complete and irresistible conviction of the beasts, most abundant and the grossest there were in the scale, lowest, scepters, wands, priestly staves, or croziers, batons, and maces, all these marks of rank with the original disc, orb, mound, surmounting with the mystic symbol of the cross, the royal reds or scepters of the European monarchs. All these forms are but the changes and reproduction of the rod of the magician. He whose creed was the fire faith and whose secret means of working upon nature was the mysterious sorcerer's sign displayed upon and through which stretched, he declared, the images of worlds and converse with the real substrata of which he pronounced was by spells, as spirit visages were only to be won to the sight or through enchantments. It has already been indicated that both Krishna and Orpheus taught the Christian mysteries. Buddha, another founder of religion, also taught these mysteries and secret doctrines, but in their negative form. The subject of Buddhism is the obscurest in the whole round of learned inquisition, says Hargrave Jennings. This old, and beyond all measure, broadest and sublimest of all the religions of the East, this ancient and really philosophical belief, demands a capacity to grasp abstractions before its principles can be understood. Men who argue from effect to cause, men who apprehend cause as all, that is, causes gathered from an experience derivable from being, cannot but fail in attaining to the disclosure of it. Materialism is a constant charge urged upon the Buddhist. In one sense, materialism is correctly assured of him. For Buddhism denounces all being apart from form as impossible. It is the purest Spinozism. It is identical with it. Accepted with the literal eye, the tenets of the Indian theology in reference to its Buddhist groundwork appear to present the usual average of mythological fabling. But we judge upon the means of expression, not upon the thing expressed. That, in the very terms of expression, has escaped. As the reconcilement of that which knows no sense with apprehension through the means of sense alone must always be impossible. Man's very being, that is, the laws by which he is of his mind, shut him up as it rare within themselves or itself, as in a prison. And all his knowledge of things comes from that light shining within his prison, his mind. Within that radius, the light is perfect and he himself perfect. But what guesses he or can he know of the great light without? That light to him may be no light. Light is material, being itself only necessary to matter and the life of it or the soul of the world. This was the faith taught by those Persians who believed in the one universal groundwork of light, the soul or ultimate principle of everything to be known, which is the religion of the Magi, of Zoroaster, of the Guebras, of the modern Indian Parsis, as of the Middle Age European Bohemians, the remains of whose fire palaces or fire temples are yet to be seen, crumbling indeed into their own god, light, around the reverend and time-battered as well as war-battered Prague. Man is the center to himself in his light of mind, shining as in his castle and prison of body. The forceful outer day, the god of the universal circle of things, once in its violent inquest, fixed, cranny and penetrating, would annihilate the temporary possessor of the tenement and absorb all within, that is him, to itself, laws to light, organism to broad being, until reincorporate, that is, concrete. The whole round world is as a microcosm whose wonders are exhaustless, whose beauties are beyond expression, whose changes, whose decay, whose recommitment into new forms is as the ceaseless revolvement of the inexpressible glory. Through the sea floors and their multitudinous mimic continents, fruitful of moving life, fecund with their three growths and their semi-sylvan, semi-oceanic vegetation, through the clouds of the seas that rest or roll over them, through which speed the winged ships as golden sun-lighted specks, through the hollow-crusted earth and its rigid rocks, earth-torn and battered like a battle-beaten man of eternal war, as it circles its resounding way amidst the roads of the lighted stars, bearing to the changing sun and to the cold, renewing moon, its ploughed side globing up, still defiant, with the wounds of the contentions of the centuries and with the retardation of the space forces, through the built work of nature, in short, runs the ever-coursing inner spirit, which forces in its stupendous track, comet-like, the bordering matter into flame, to life. 
Is not all the world a woven tissue, wizard-colored, of which the creative sun strikes the spangles into sparkling, stains prismatically with the rose hues of being or the blues of decay, or rather, change? Roars, not old ocean with his caves, as the nereid music swelleth or sinketh to fascination loudly or faintly through its shell. Fires and smokes and springs and steam attest the attenuate bulk, spun through the hands of the great magnetic life, or by the power of the earth body into tissues. What is at the core and the mighty heart of the great world but the spouting fire? What are the magnificent air shapes of our atmosphere? What the crossed cloud platforms of our sky? What the reduplicate and multiplicate fog work and flocculence of the western or the eastern heavens, when the golden or the burning light is poured through the heaped wonder worlds of the magician of the great air? What should be all the cloud settings of our sky, but as the precipitate and dross of the mere used up matter, glorious to our senses as even all the refuse is, and if fire be in its own nature, so to speak, but the roaring back, the illuminate of nature from the real unto the unreal, as which the Magi teach, and as which the worshippers of the spirit of fire believe, then the very excess of material light shall be but as the very excess of the dense matter remonstrating, as it were, itself the brighter as it is in itself the blacker. Nor are these the vagaries of philosophers, but the world-old persuasions when the vanity of knowledge had not made a base machine of wheels of the world. Let us rest with this sublime assurance the kingdom of God lieth much nearer to us than we believe in our vain imagination of possibilities. Yea, is at our door, God on our threshold, we all the while, Peter-like, denying him, denying the spirits because we cannot feel the spirit. The old Buddhists, as equally as the ancient believers in the doctrine of the universal spiritual fire, taught that spirit light was the floor or basis of all created things. The material side or complement of this spiritual light being fire, into which element all things could be rendered, and which fire or heat was the motive of all things that are. They taught that matter or mind as the superflux, as the sum of sensations or as natural and unreal shows of their various kinds were applied as layer on layer or tissue on tissue on this immutable and immortal floor or groundwork of divine flame, the soul of the world. Such is the magnificent view the Buddhists hold of creation. Is it any wonder that it has more votaries than any other system of religion? Fire, love, God is the foundation of this philosophy, though in this instance taught in a negative form, that God can be reached by means of contemplation rather than by work, which supplies us with the key as to the reason a few Englishmen can rule millions of the inhabitants of India. The emotion, intensity, mind agitation, thought, according to the powers of the unit or the lifting heavenward, or as the dots or dimples in the ever-flowing on wave of being were, to speak in the familiar sense, as impressions down, perhaps through and through its covers, upon this living floor of spiritual flame, the escape of which was the magnetism, magnetism of the body, supersensual force or miracle of the spirit. The Paracelsists of the 16th century were also philosophers of fire and were known as such. The fire philosophers, or philosophy per ignum, were known throughout every country of Europe and declared that the intimate Essenes of natural things were only to be known by the trying effects of fire, directed in a chemical process. They insisted that human reason might be a dangerous and deceitful guide, that no real progress could be made in knowledge or in religion by it, and that to all vital, that is, supernatural purpose, it was a vain thing. They also taught that divine and supernatural exaltation was the only means of arriving at truth. Their name of Paracelsists was derived from Paracelsus, the eminent physician and chemist, who was the chief philosopher of this school. After the famed fraternities or discovery of the fraternity of the most laudable order of the Rosy Cross was issued by Christian Rosencrutz, they became known as Rosicrucians. See the Rosicrucians, their teachings. In England, Robert Flood was their great advocate and exponent. Rivier, who wrote in France. Severinus, an author of Denmark. Kunrath, an eminent physician of Dresden. And Daniel Hoffman, professor of divinity in the University of Helmstadt, have also treated largely on Paracelsus and on his system, akin to the school of the ancient philosophers and of the magnetists of a later period, says Dr. Enemosa, 
of the same cast as these speculators and searchers into the mysteries of nature drawing from the same source, were the Theosophists, the Paracelsists were termed Theosophists by this author, of the 16th and 17th centuries. These practiced chemistry by which they asserted that they could explain the profoundest secrets of nature. As they strove above all earthly knowledge after the divine and sought the divine light and fire, through which all men acquire the true wisdom, they were called the fire philosophers. As a great general principle, they called the soul of fire taken from the eternal ocean of light. Hargrave Jennings, the Rosicrucian and philosopher says, we may thus sum our historical examination, that at every turn of our inquiry, we meet light. At every crossroad, as it were, of our laborious journey, of our philosophical pilgrimage, we encounter this pertinacious and ever flowing light not only at birth, but as taking a prominent part in the torch celebration at marriage and again and more impressively at death and in the ceremonials of sepulture, the phantom of light never fails. It is the more dimly or the brighter, the more gloriously and the more cheerfully celebrant or the more awfully full everywhere disclosed as everything it must, though disguised, be everything. What may mean this concentrate resplendent fever, this ever flowing myth this terrible and yet this grand angel found at the couch side at our birth, accompanying us as the best and most distant sacrifice to the altar of presentation, where our mother bows in her thanksgivings to the holy God who has helped her in her time of need and who has equally made birth and life and death and has equally vouchsafed safety in each and all. What is this that presseth in chiefest of guests at our marriages in all the splendor of his yellowest glow and waiting with his face shrouded with his pale lights and abounding in ghostly tapers, though in the glory of the hope of heaven, at that last solemn scene, where the very cause of the sable royalties, black, imperial, then alike to poor and rich in the common spirit threshold upon which we all stand, is as the smallest and very often the least thought of of all the show. What, to conclude, is this fire which is so constantly about us, and of which we think so little and know so little, but which seems overwhelmingly much. What is this wondrous universal element or least provable soul of the world, which hath been so significantly and yet so unsuspectedly mythed universally through the intelligent ages? What is this magic reflection, which is glassed through time? We ask thinkers for an answer, but only out of their meditations, only out of the impossibility of denial, do we hope to wring the confession of the divine spirit that is in the fire? Of course, we have no reference to material fire, but to a something of which the material fire is merely an image, being the imparticled spirit in which everything is at one, as in which are the things only unreal, and unreal things out of the world are the only real. Through two baptismals must the initiate pass, through the baptism of both fire and water. The mysterious meaning of baptism by water is a symbolism prevailing through all faiths, heathen and Christian. It is that of the earliest traditional or the Pythagorean transmigration, not adjudged as by its vulgar reading, but as signifying the onward dissolution into nothingness of being, that is of this being, through the farthest separated, save air, in which man always is, and therefore always is baptized, matter, water, this, therefore, is the only element for a rite. Holy water and ablution also signify the same, although the church has lost the meaning. Thence, as from the next loosest of matters, water, the only possible symbol for a rite. Man is delivered into the farther supernatural airy changes where matter ceases, loosening utterly from above him. And then the spirit of fire begins, taking up the matter undulations. This is the freedom into the foundations or inspiring light, the God flame of the Magi, the Holy Spirit of the Christians, the everything out of this state and the nothing in it of all religions. Life, nay, all existence being considered as a purgatory of a severer or a more assuasive order, and therefore being evil or God's shadow for the very reason of its being life or consciousness at all. This is the mystic meaning of that text in the New Testament where St. John declares, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he that comes after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost. In the language of the philosophers, this is the baptism with fire. 
Thank you for watching and please don't forget to share, like, subscribe and comment and if you can, please consider donating to Wars of the Roses links to PayPal and Patreon are in the description. Thank you so very much.